So, so I, I spent a little time with, uh, before listening to Bill Brinkman talk about uh, in the computational group annual conference, and he talked about science, so I'll talk about computation. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk about, this is again something I've been thinking about over the next, uh, put the mic down. There we go. In fact, I'm not sure I need it at all, right? Thanks. Uh, combination of uh, Sputnik, uh, climate, Fukushima, and small modular reactors. And they may not seem that they go together, but I'll try to build a story to show you how these things are are basically connected and the ability to actually change the game. And I think we're getting close to changing the game, if, if you will, in nuclear power, I'll get that way. And the key is, of course, how we changed the, the back in the early part of this of, uh, last century, when the, the game was changed by Henry Ford from making cars one at a time to putting them in the factory. And we're basically getting to that same point here. Um, so before I get further, I've been thinking a lot about uh, innovation and what all that means. And so I've been reading a number of books on this subject. And these are some of the titles, all of which are very good. I just finished a book on called The, uh, the Idea Factory about Bell Telephone Laboratories, uh, which I hardly recommend because Bell Telephone uh, Laboratories, you know, not just produced a whole lot of uh, Nobel Prize winners, but they also, you know, the transistor, the laser, uh, the solar cell, uh, the whole idea of, uh, of uh, uh, information theory in the, in the first part, uh, much of the work on, uh, cli on uh, uh, that uh, Deming did uh, in terms of quality control came from uh, her earlier work at uh, Bell Labs. Uh, it was the premier lab probably in the world, and it doesn't exist anymore. So as you think about what you're you know, what we're going, why part of it is why are we, you know, basically what are we doing? I guess it still exists, but just for relatively smart. So it's an interesting book about how that built up and then, of course, how that, that disappeared. So that was just going. I, I got interested in this Sputnik stuff. Uh, the secretary, um, Chu, gave a talk uh, back in uh, November of uh, 2010. He said, hey, is the energy race our new Sputnik moment? Uh, and then he discussed, I, I'm not sure this was the very same conversation that he gave with the, with the president, but it might have been. Uh, and because, uh, gee, well, in the next, uh, just a few months later, why, isn't PowerPoint wonderful, by the way? Right. <laughs> uh, I was, as I uh, as, as I was introduced, I ran the, the you know, defense programs, which I had uh, you know, 30,000 uh, people working for you, and then next, uh, you know, over the weekend, I had nobody working for me, so I had to learn how to do PowerPoint all by myself. It's really interesting, if you do it right. So this is, this is, uh, this is part of the State of the Union address uh, 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 back in January of 2011, where the uh, uh, president mentions, hey, Soviets beat us to space with Sputnik, um, satellite, and so forth. Uh, now, of course, uh, and he says, hey, uh, this could be, if you will, energy, clean energy in particular, may, perhaps could be our, our, our Sputnik moment. He also talks about the, the, the variety of things that one could uh, deal with that in terms of energy, Democrats and Republicans working together, and he says, hey, come along and we'll make, uh, we'll in turn make things into the Apollo program, if you will, of our, of our time. So he connected Sputnik then with, uh, with Apollo, of course, uh, I will point out to this group, he said the science wasn't even there yet. Actually, the science was there. It was Newton and Lavoisier. The science was several hundred years, several hundred years old, at least, right? Before that, you're a scientist, so just to be, want to correct that. So let's go back and look, uh, look let's, indeed, what, what happened then, really, and how that might relate to what we're doing. There's Sputnik in October 4th, 1957. I'm not sure anybody here was born, uh, well, well, only two of us. But there was this little satellite, right, that showed up. This is again in, in, uh, on October 4th. You know, it's about that big, went up there. Whoops, boy, what in the world? I mean, it really caused a, caused a major, major uh, concern. Uh, and what I'll try to do then is use this, if you will, is to put a model together in terms of what, uh, uh, from a strategic planning perspective, which says, hey, what's the, what does the president say? What does he want to do? 
Uh, what's the strategy that comes along with that? And then what's the timely goal? Well, Eisenhower was the president at the time, and he felt that indeed that um, uh, the organizational structure to that uh, Sputnik represented a challenge from the Soviet Union and the, the organizational structure uh, in, the, in the government, and the, including the educational structure, was not sufficient. That was, that's what that meant. So he started at DARPA back in, in February. Notice that was October, February. He started a whole new organization. I was the director at DARPA at some time. Uh, then he started NASA, okay, which was in July. So uh, at that point, uh, DARPA went back to doing military things and from that point on. But notice a whole new organization basically was set up. Okay, so that it, it got going. Uh, then, of course, uh, several years later, uh, the Russians, the uh, Soviets, put up the first man in space, uh, Yuri Gagarin, back in April, in April of 1961. Uh, and people don't remember this, but there was something called a Cuban Missile, uh, a Bay of Pigs, rather, uh, occurred uh, just within the same week, which was not a big success. And so there was a crisis of confidence, if you will, in the government of the United States and question, what do we do about this and how do we respond? I had the opportunity to read a number of the uh, memos that went back and forth during that, basically during that period in terms of what do we do? And of course the solution uh, was indeed, uh, uh, let's do the Apollo program. In other words, let's send a man to the moon within a decade, a timely goal, and bring him back. Okay, sort of, and bring it back. Well, that was the thing that uh, focused uh, NASA. Uh, and I happened to work for NASA at the time. The Army sent me there uh, because it was such a high-level program. It, it was part of the national security issue of the time, even though it was an entirely civilian program. It was entirely civilian, but it was important enough that uh, despite the concern uh, uh, those of us who were in the service who had degrees, uh, were, were assigned, reassigned you know, to NASA because it was that, working on that program was that important. Of course, then it was indeed successful, but the point, of course, is that this was really part of our Cold War strategy. Okay. But that represents the uh, model. I think that will take forward. Well, uh, you're all part of the stockpile stewardship uh, program, uh, and uh, so that, that brings me into it a little more directly. Uh, the president then had a vision back in uh, July of 1963. How do we assure our nuclear deterrent uh, unquestioned under a test ban? Because the, the, the issue then really was can we stop testing and maintain our deterrence? And he said, we'll have to look at other means of doing that. He didn't say what they were, okay, but he said not to worry. Uh, Department of Energy will do that. I have to be the person. Uh, I had to figure out how to, basically how to make that happen. And, what, uh, and so what I brought in was three of the uh, persons who were most responsible at each of the, actually two each at each of the labs, uh, and we sat down and put the program. And I, I only put together one really request, and the, the thing that I brought was indeed this be a science-based program. So if you said, what, do, what, what did I do really was say, hey, wait a minute, this has got to be a, science-based program because if you can't go and test, that means you really do have to understand what's happening uh, and you have to dig all the way back and try to basically do that because you can't go out and this is no longer, a, a, you know, Thomas Edison, this is now Louis Pasteur. You have to really understand what's happening. So we basically put that together and what is the program? And it turns out to be validated simulation, okay, which is really twofold. One is that you've got to indeed uh, partner with a high performance computing, because we don't build our own computers, we work with other company, we work with the computer companies to buy them, and you've got to then have to validate this, which means you need a series of validation experiments that go along with that. Uh, so uh, part of that, then each laboratory, if you will, since there are three laboratories, each laboratory sort of got one or got a program that goes along with that. Obviously, the National Ignition Facility was at uh, Livermore. Uh, what became Mesa uh, in terms of was the started out of, from uh, Sandia, which is really the materials, electronics, and all the things that go with that. And at Livermore, both was accelerated production of tritium and the uh, um, dual axis DART, which then, if you will, has, has gone on to be Marie, basically Marie. 
So then we also had to hire, work with the, each of the, uh, each of the, where, where are you going, you need a computer to do that. Each of the laboratories then ended up partnering with some member of the, of the commercial, commercial department. Now, uh, one other thing, which is related to my thing about the intermingling of computing and science, whether well, that's go together. Well, the person I hired to do this uh, was, a, uh, was Gil Wygand, who, you know, and when G and, uh, Gil was, a Sandi was working, basically working at Sandia at the time, uh, he had been a, one of my program managers at uh, DARPA, so I, we worked very, had worked very closely. And so I said, Gil, uh, his, his instructions were also pretty simple. When you go back to the laboratory, don't talk to the computing people at all. Talk to the people who are the weapons designers, who are the scientists, and try to get what they feel they need. In other words, putting the science and the uh, computation together. And oh, by the way, I said, let's not work with the commercial people who, in the computing, as opposed to something very, very special. Okay, so you had to integrate in with the, with the computational. Uh, people who are gonna make money building these large computers, as opposed to just building a very special computer that only the laboratories might be able to use. This had to be more of a general purpose machine. Well, uh, then you question, what's the timely goal? This is uh, Charlie McMillan, who was then at the, uh, he's now currently the director of, uh, of Los Alamos. At the time, he was head of one of the divisions uh, at, uh, uh, at Livermore. And I said, okay, let's take a look and where we are. Uh, uh, let's assume we're gonna be doing this in 10 years. I'll tell you how I got to 10 years or so. But he says, what is it that you know, if I look at the type of a problem you have to work, which is a, a very small uh, uh, shocks uh, coming out, changes, and so forth and so on, and I have to use three dimensions. Uh, and uh, so he went back and figured out what the problem is, and he said, uh, gee, we only want this machine to run about a couple of weeks at most on a problem, put that together, it turned out to be something like 100 teraflops. Uh, when do you have to have this to make this a timely goal? Well, uh, you know, I said, let's do this by 2004. Why? Well, that's a picture of Seymour Sack, who passed away just recently. And I said, he was one who designed much of the, much of the uh, uh, weapons in the stockpile itself. Uh, he's the one we really care about saying, is this going to be useful or not? It's not the president or, you know, or even the secretary of energy. He's the one we, ha we have to convince this is a good thing to do it. All right, because uh, that's it. So that's basically how it went. Then, of course, we had to do the, convince the rest of the, the, the politics. Hazel O'Leary, a work of the team there, uh, the, the Department of Defense. That's Bill Perry, who was Secretary of Defense. Also happens to have a, uh, you know, a PhD actually in mathematics, a very technically sound. John Ch Chali Kashvili at the time was the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. Uh, people might, you know, uh, who also happen to have a bachelor's degree in engineering. So we had some very, very technically savvy people that are in charge, and at the end of this, of course, is how you get the Congress, and that was uh, Pete Domenici. Uh, Pete uh, uh, was the senator from New Mexico and, or the, uh, and was very, very, also not only head of the committee he, of the uh, Energy and Water Committee, he was also head of the Budget Committee. It was very understanding in terms of what, basically what you had to do. And so the, 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 the key is how do you pull together a strategy, how do you pull together a team, and then do you have a goal that makes it, make it happen? Okay, and of course, uh, in this case, the, 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 uh, this was Charlie, the, the uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense is Charlie. Uh, uh, Anybody remember his name? Yeah, senior moment. All right, and, and Charlie, uh, you know, was a lawyer, spent a, but he happened to have a bachelor's degree in chemistry at the time. So what we're seeing is, gee, even though these were people basically with a political basis, they had, a, a, I think, an understanding of what, if you will, is scientific concern. When I was lucky in that regard. So this is where we are right now. This is uh, uh, Perry and Schlesinger's report uh, to the Congress saying, hey, stockpile stewardship 
uh, remarkable success, much more than people had anticipated. Of course, I anticipated it was going to work, right? Most people labs anticipated it was going to work, but nonetheless, there were some skeptics that, were, in fact, whether you could do this. Uh, why is that? Why was successful? Well, you know, uh, this isn't a case where the government owns the whole problem. All right, nuclear weapons is indeed an important thing in the government. There's no private nuclear weapons business. Uh, we were able to define the problem. We were able to put down well-defined goals. Uh, we were able to get alignment of the relevant institutions. This was something the labs wanted to do. This is something the Defense Department do. So we were able to get every, and this indeed was something we could work with the computer companies because while they were not doing this for, they were not doing this for uh, uh, patriotic purposes, they were doing it because they thought they could make money at high performance for uh, on computing. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, we've had sustained uh, funding for this program uh, for, 15, you know, basically for 15, uh, 15 since, the, since it came. It didn't start off with so much funding, but it built up very quickly, and that funding was sustained over time. Uh, I mentioned uh, the Bell Telephone situation, and they had sustained funding for many, many, many years, and then it, you know, it, when the, with the breakup, that basically disappeared, and they disappeared as a unit. Well, how well we did, this is a, uh, we certainly changed the game, if you will, in that case, in high performance computing, right? The, uh, uh, the slope, let me see. Right, you can see here, this was where we were going, and all of a sudden that sloped, basically, basically changed. Of course, this is the whole idea of massively, massively parallel computing, not just making the chips better and better, but taking the better and better chips and putting them together and learning how to do the software so all the chips talk to each other uh, and you still end up with a, with a faster, faster system. That's where we are. Uh, See, this is the President uh, Obama giving the president of, uh, of uh, IBM the National Medal of uh, Technology for this. Of course, neither of them had anything to do with the program, but they were there in time to get there. <laughs> so they were there. <laughs> so, okay. uh, now, what's happened, of course, is that this is a, just, what, a few weeks ago, uh, it was named that uh, by God. Not only, it, it, uh, this is the tw 20 petaflop machine the Sequoia machine at the uh, uh, at uh, Livermore. So we're still, if you will, not only really changing the game in terms of how you do high performance computing, but still basically at the top of that, basically at the top of that game. Pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable achievement. Okay, so now let's get to civil, uh, civil, uh, civil nuclear power leadership and that's small modular reactors. Uh, back in June of 2010, uh, Pete Miller and Pete Lyons, who were then the, uh, the, the Assistant Secretaries of Nuclear Energy, uh, said, hey, I'm, I, we're, we're thinking of starting a program in small modular reactors. Uh, could you come and help, uh, you know, help uh, put together a story for us as to why these things are important, why they might, in fact, actually change the game? Uh, they were having a lot of problems getting their, their, this idea through the Office of Management and Budget. So we, we now know, when you see the model, if you will, of you know, how you can basically, this model doesn't always work, but let's give it a try here. So what's the president's vision? So you have to look back now and, and uh, find some, something in what the president has said, says this consistent with what he's doing, and this is something out of the Prague speech. Uh, that he talked about in, uh, 2000, in April of 2010. This was really a national security speech, and for those of you who haven't, haven't read it, I would recommend you go back, because it really sets the tone uh, for nuclear security across the board uh, in terms of what this administration is trying to, basically trying to do. Uh, but notice, even in the, uh, the national security, he mentions this combination of climate change and and, and peak. so, so this, this is the connection. Now, what's the, and so what are the, if you will, what are the other things that have been talked about? Climate, uh, clean energy, uh, competitiveness, and indeed national security in terms of nonproliferation. Uh, what's the strategy? Well, the strategy uh, in this case really is how do I align, okay, how do I align the goals of the U.S. electricity sector where much of this with the 
national goals. And that's a bit, you know, that's very difficult to do because your local utility company doesn't really care about nonproliferation. They don't necessarily care about climate change or economic competitiveness. They just want to sell you electricity at a reasonable price that you can afford and you can buy enough of it so that they can, you know, uh, earn, earn a profit for their, their investors. How, and then it's a much more, again, much more complicated system. And then indeed, what might be a timely goal, because that's the model. Well, it took a while, that same 2011, where the president says, hey, 2035, uh, uh, we want 80% of the uh, America's electricity to come from clean energy sources. So that's basically the model that one wants to look at for these small modular, small modular reactors. Well, let's just talk briefly about climate change. Uh, it's interesting that uh, I snuck over to hear what Bill Brinkman was saying in the other group, and his first chart was climate change. In fact, it was this chart. It was, he had a blow up of that one basically right, that one right there, and spent most of his time talking about, sort of talking about that. But this is all you really need to know about climate change. One, CO2 really is rising. There doesn't seem to be any controversy about that. Uh, this is real data. Uh, number two is, hey, the temperature does indeed seem to be rising over the last, uh, uh, I don't have to tell you to go outside, but the temperature is, you know, basically data on that. While people have, data, uh, people have uh, questioned that, that kind of data, uh, that, that, uh, that's getting stronger and stronger. There are far fewer people who are questioning whether this is, whether the temperature is actually rising or not. The issue that, of course, the science problem uh, that's just basically, you know, collecting data, even though it's not necessarily easy. The science problem is shown here is, okay, how do I show this and this are, are the same? And that's a combination of modeling and the science that basically goes into that. And this is the IPC rule. And then on top of that, of course, is the, well, okay, now what does that, if that's true, what does that mean? I'm showing then the, you know, this, this polar bear. I guess there was something in the paper about the, uh, you know, the, the, the ice flow all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, nobody expected this, this was showing up. So this look really looks like an important issue. I don't know, how, I, I sometimes say, well, how many people in the room believe climate change is important? Or I could ask how many people don't believe climate change is important? I don't know how you answer that. You don't believe, here okay. Just, there's always one, right? Yeah. Actually, right, that's right. Okay. So, uh, uh, Okay, so, and of course, then I'm, I'm trying to, you know, there doesn't seem to be any doubt where the, what the, where the president was coming from. So I, I started out building, if you will, building the story based upon climate change. Uh, this is just a little more, I mean, in the connection with electricity, the problem, of course, the difficulty is, isn't it, it isn't just climate. Okay, you still have to say, well, how do I do this at the same time I'm, I'm uh, encouraging the rest of the world, you know, to, to a use more electricity, and then having some of the more wealthy companies use less electricity. But electricity is still extraordinarily difficult thing to do. So let me give you this is my look at this uh, climate change. It says, hey, uh, the net absorption of CO2 of the Earth is about 14, you know, gigatons a year. The total population is uh, uh, two billion. So as far as the net equilibrium is concerned, everybody gets two tons of CO2 per person per year. If you use more than that, you're probably adding to the burden. If you use less than that, you're helping a little bit, just to give you a sense of, of scaling, if you will, that, that problem. For electricity, then, it's pretty simple. Uh, OK, how much electricity do I use? That's one minus the amount of clean energy you have times those one kilograms per kilowatt which is how much you get from coal. So first, you know, all the fancy mathematics you can just do pretty simply. Uh, where are we? Well, the U.S. right now is 12,000, approximately 12,500 kilowatt hours per person. It's a little bit less, and that varies from state to state. Uh, you put the numbers together, that says clean energy is 42%, or about 10, 10 tons per year just from electricity uh, that we're dumping into the atmosphere. You can argue whether where you know how much that means in terms of climate, but that's what we're doing compared to China's two tons per year. Of course, it's a lot less clean energy, and they have a, they they use a lot less electricity, but there's a lot more people. 
And of course, the other example is France, I put on, you know, which uses about half amount of electricity per person in the, the, that we do in the US. Uh, they're 83, you know, 93% clean energy from electricity. Oh, well, that's nuclear, and of course, their, their tons per year are much, much lower. Okay, so that gives you, if you will, a sample of where, where we are. Now, where did the secretary come out? Uh, this is an article he wrote in Wall Street Journal about small modular reactors, and he picks up the major advantages, if you will, and things about small modular reactor. First of all, he starts with U.S. competitiveness because these small modular reactors ostensibly would be made in the United States of America. Uh, the whole idea is because they're small, uh, the utilities can afford them. Okay. Uh, flexible, may fit the, fit the grid, and indeed the market for them is the, the, in this country, I'll show you a little bit later, we have a lot of retiring coal plants, what are we going to use for those? And so that's ostensibly the market's waiting to happen. So let's look at clean energy, what does that all mean in terms of secretary? So this was all going well, and of course the first thing that happened is the Congress changed. Okay. Uh, you know, so that's the, the 2010 election. A lot of people were elected who don't think climate change is important, uh, even though the president said, no, no, it's still important, and this is something maybe we can work together on. The second thing, and perhaps this was, of course, uh, people began to realize shale gas. All right, so that changed. Everybody's going to be using shale gas, which is cleaner than coal, though it still gives half the amount of CO2. But all of a sudden, if you talk about energy right now, you don't get very far before you now talk about shale gas. And then the next thing, of course, is uh, Fukushima. Okay. Uh, well, so the uh, so I'm gonna try to put this story together at SMR, small modular reactors. I still got to worry about people who don't quite think climate is useful uh, or important. Uh, all of a sudden, I've got natural gas to worry about. On top of that, uh, most of the people in the world now think that nuclear power is unsafe. Okay, so how do you basically put this down? And what I'm suggesting is maybe that's the Sputnik moment. All right, because what, did, what was the Sputnik about? Was this event occurred that, that we didn't really expect that all of a sudden it changed the way we think about. In that case, it was uh, we think about uh, how the interplay between national security and space involved the Cold War. Maybe this should take us, give us an opportunity to think through, if you will, where does nuclear power play in this whole whole picture. Maybe there's a different way. Maybe we should be changing the game in terms of where we do this. Uh, this is this goes back looking at the clean energy standard. Uh, remember, I still am concerned with 2035. All right, I want to be able to uh, uh, meet 80% clean energy. This is where we are right now. Uh, we're 42%. Okay, the Energy Information Agency, which gathers the statistics, does some modeling, projects where we are given, given the various policies. They say in 2035, we're really gonna make an improvement, we're gonna get to 43%. Okay, so that, you know, that says, wait a minute, there's gonna have to be some basically changes. So I said, all right, you're in the Department of Energy, suppose you say, that this, at this point I just, you know, this is all my own, I just invented all this. This is not policy, but I said, hey, look, Suppose we don't have any new building of, of coal plants, but that all coal after, that it's older than 50 years gets phased out. Put those two things together, and the department has talked about renewable goals. They've talked about goals for CCS, uh, carbon sequestration. Let's assume those are met. Put the numbers together, okay, and you still end up pretty short. In fact, you end up saying, well, I need another 1,200 uh, terawatt hours of clean energy. And I'm saying that's where you've got to fill in with, with small modular reactors. So there is indeed a market basically out there that fits the policy that for small modular reactors. Okay. Now, the problem, of course, is that I've got, who am I aligning with? I'm aligning with the utilities who have to buy this stuff. This is not the nuclear weapons program where, you know, the, the, you go to the, talk to the Department of Defense or the president, and they say, I need deterrent. You know, I need so many. Okay, that that's Congress goes along with that. This is a very different story. Uh, this is a, a, a talk that the head of Exelon, John Rowe, put together uh, to the American Nuclear Society. Exelon has the most largest number of, of nuclear plants in this country. 
this is where we are right now. He says, hey, we're in business, right? This is not a religion to us. We have to make money with this stuff, okay? Uh, and so where are we? And he says, and there again, as you would expect, you know, their concern is that those lights go on every time that you want to and without you even thinking about it. Right? So that's a reasonable thing. They're very prudent, very conservative in how they do things. And they said, we'll buy new ones, all right, but you've got to maintain the high level of performance. We, we're continuing to do that, by the way. They have quite remarkable, their capacity factors are well over 90%, much better than any other thing. Uh, they want to extend the life of the current reactors. And then they said, hey, we'll buy new ones, but you know, when they become licensed and cost competitive. And right now, there are th these are the ones that are either licensed or or close to it, and then as you can see, they're all very, very, two things. One, they're all very big, and they're all made by foreign, or almost foreign owners, if not foreign companies. GE's here, Westinghouse is here, but indeed, they're, they're owned by foreign, so, hmm. Now, what is, where is the government? Well, the government is driven by, if you will, large measure by the spent fuel problem. Uh, safety and security is part of the N Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Environment is EPA, proliferation is part of DOE, and uh, in particular NNSA, which is funding your, your, you know, your education, uh, I hope. Uh, and of course, for many years, it was driven by what we're going to do with the waste, was driven in, in large measure by Yucca Mountain. That was changed by the Blue Ribbon Commission, who says, hey, no more Yucca Mountain. Uh, you better think about something else. Now, there's not quite clear where that will go, but that's basically the smart. But in the meantime, within the Department of Energy, there's the nuclear energy, nuclear power. They put together a program called Nuclear Power 210, which is now basically finished, which says, hey, what we will, what we will do for you, uh, nuclear power industry, is we will help get, we'll cost share the design certification and license. That program is basically completed. Uh, but in fact, that's what that several of these reactors, in fact, the main ones, have, have gone through that process. So we know that basically works. The key on these were for looking at these large ones was this whole idea of passive safety. In other words, they started out by saying, what does passive safety mean? Uh, well, you don't need pumps. Or, uh, as much as possible, you use natural, basically natural circulation. Uh, the grass half number for those of you who are in this, right, as opposed to the Reynolds number. Okay, okay so uh, now, okay, now how do I make this, can I at all make this affordable? The problem is, of course, uh, if you look at uh, where this is a, an MIT result of a few, uh, a few years ago, they did some you know, analysis, uh, it says, wait a minute, nuclear is still gonna cost more than, uh, than coal, uh, 8.2 cents a kilowatt hour, coal is 6.2 cents a kilowatt hour. I'd ask you whether you know what, how much you pay for electricity, but since NNSA is paying for it, for you, for your stipend, right, you probably don't know how much you're paying for electricity. I mean, does anybody know what they're paying for? Well, good, you should, you know, students shouldn't have to worry about what they're paying for electricity. Well, what you see, of course, is that if you're, if you're trying to do this, you're gonna end up you're going to end up um, uh, if you're you're going to end up buying coal, okay? Unless of course you uh, uh, have a coal tax, right? The first thing you do, well, if you you know have a carbon tax or cap and trade or something like that, which indeed was part of the administration's approach uh, to get started, that that went away. All right, so that is impossible. The other possibility is uh, loan guarantees to help you get through this high cost of uh, capital, and that was it. So it's, ah, if I do loan guarantees, maybe I can, I can start to move. The problem, of course, is, is that uh, uh, large nuclear reactors are very cost intensive. In other words, you need the money up front. Okay. You have to have a large, even once, if you average it out over 40 years, you could say, well, this is really good. But of course, uh, if you have this large amount of money that you have to pay up front, that becomes very, very difficult. Especially when you, and you don't have to look at all this. This shows you there are a lot of, there are a lot of utilities in this country, and there's not, if you will, this compares with France. Remember, France was really great. Well, the problem with France is there's one company, and it's run by the government. 
these are a whole lot of companies, they all have to make uh, profit, or, or at least break even, okay, and they, they don't have all that much money, even though they're relatively large companies to, to start out with this. Right? So there's really not a good impedance match between their financial structure and large nuclear, and building new large reactors. It's a question of affordability. It isn't just long-term economics. So this is where I get to innovation uh, for small modularities. That's Jose Reyes, who's a graduate. Who's a, got his, I think he's got his PhD at the University of Miracle in, 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 um, in nuclear. I don't know if it's nuclear engineering or physics or something like that. And he went to work for the NRC, and he said, can I design a, a reactor that from the start Okay, uh, is absolutely safe. So is very simple and very safe. Like for example, what was the problem in Fukushima? Well, they, they couldn't get the pumps working because they couldn't get electricity. Well, this doesn't have any pumps. It works entirely on natural and natural. The whole idea of of basically doing that. And so he then went to work uh, for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He left. He's a professor now at Oregon State University. They got some. Uh, funding from this from the Department of Energy, Office of Nuclear Energy. Uh, they left and, and sort of put together a, a company called New Scale Power, which is now working with Fluor. And they've come up with this idea of a 45 megawatt super safe uh, reactor that you, that you can move, you build entirely in a factory and move toward, uh, move to the site on a truck. This is changing the game, right? Uh, a similar approach. Uh, what came from Babcock and Wilcox. All right, they said, well, they, back some years ago, they used to work on uh, ship reactors. In fact, they're the main ones who are d designing this for the, you know, for the US Navy and different fuel and everything. But basically, they sort of basically took this approach and ended up with something very similar. Theirs can't go on a truck, it goes on, however, it can go on a train. But the whole idea of we build it in a factory. At that point, Westinghouse, who's built this AP-1000, said, wait a minute, we can do this too, uh, you know, and we'll take what we've learned on that and indeed build them. Sli all slightly different stories, and there's one more that's in the game, which is a company called Holtec, which actually built casks, all right, for use for wheels. So, wait, we, you know, we, can, we know how to build uh, reactors as well, but the key on all of them is they're all potentially factory built, and you just take it, take it to the site on conventional you know, transportation. This is really different. You know, uh, they're all, however, which is important, they're all a pressurized water design. So there's no new physics or chemistry that comes to this. It's just an innovation of using what we know. They all use commercial light water, low enriched fuel. So it's identical fuel for the big reactors, which is smaller. Okay, but it uses all of these, claim they're using the U.S. industrial base. So you don't have to take them, you know, you don't have to go overseas to basically build them. You might, I mean, but you don't really have to. You have the industrial base here. And therefore, because they come in smaller chunks, they're affordable for the U.S. utilities. This is the game changer. And I'm saying this whole game changing is the way when we first did automobiles, uh, you know, they were hand-built, they were wonderful, okay, but they were very expensive. They lasted a long time and so forth, but it was Henry Ford said, well, maybe we can, maybe you don't need all that, we can make them in a factory and, and, and change, the, change the game in that way. And so this is basically that, that approach. Uh, I, I'll go through this very quickly. They really started designing this thing from safety first and security first. There's an analogy in terms of, uh, of nuclear weapons here, the modern nuclear weapon, uh, those built in the 80s and 90s, and the ones we're thinking about now in terms of even their life, start with the whole idea of let's integrate safety and security in with the, you know, in with the performance. In fact, much of the innovation in terms of nuclear weapons over the past 10 or 15 years has really been in the safety and security perspective is can I build that into the design itself and, and not lose any of the performance that I actually need. Uh, again, these, these, the analysis. So this just shows very quickly that there's, in terms of the market, uh, this is just all the coal plants that are out there generating electricity. Some of those you can see are very old, 
Okay, and these are, the, and many, many of them are relatively small. Uh, and the question is, okay, that's the market because those things are clearly gonna have to be, have to be replaced. Now, are you gonna replace them with natural gas or are you gonna replace them with nuclear power, in particular small modular reactors? Uh, and the key here is, uh, is a relatively, uh, you know, there's a little bit of mathematics in this, but what happens, of course, is, is as you build things, traditionally, there's no, this is like a, a Moore's law or something like that. As you build things over time in factories, people learn how to do it better and better and better, and the costs drop off. And this is true about any mo locomotives, uh, large structures of all sorts. I mean, that's one of the advantages of fat, uh, um, air, you know, Airbus, airplanes, and so forth, uh, that if you do it right, by God, you get this uh, learning process. And of course, we've never done, we've never built one, and we've never built the factory to make it happen, but nonetheless, uh, that's part of the deal. Can you, in fact, generate these things now, change the game? Uh, point out that we do this, the, the, much of the contractors who are now thinking about this are uh, uh, working for the U.S. Navy, and they've been able to show that they're some of the most advanced uh, high-performance uh, factories in the world. And even on things like submarines, they've been able to drive down this, uh, this learning. So that gives you some hope. Uh, this is pretty popular than SMRs around the rest of the world. Uh, North, uh, South Korea in particular, Russia, uh, Japan, uh, China, uh, France, uh, you know, this is a buzz sort of, sort of thing. I'm particularly concerned, you know, the South Korea and the Chinese one really looks very similar to many of the things we've been, we've been talking about. Uh, the, now, what we, where we have, it took a while, but by God, in this, in this year's budget and in next year's budget, there is a, uh, the administration is putting out $67 million, if you will, uh, to do this cost share to get the design certified for the four two, um, I don't. What I gave you before was some of the people who probably are anticipating. You know, all four won't get it, but at least certainly probably at least two will get. Will get started in doing this design certification. Uh, this was a discussion again, getting back to the president. I, he, it puts together uh, warming, nuclear energy, national security, all tying it together. Uh, we're looking at innovative approaches, you know, and indeed at Ohio State, I don't know if Ohio State, he mentioned specifically that this is now part of the serious part of the of the program. Okay, so let's see how this might work out. This is my last chart. Uh, I now go to this is the this is the speech. He gave at uh, uh, in, in South Korea just a few months ago. Uh, same didn't change didn't change the goal, just changed the speech. And the strategy again is aligning the electricity sector specifically with uh, national goals, and we think we can do that uh, with license two more of these ultra safe SMRs manufacture, potentially use the industrial base that we have in this country already, and then, but now you have to compete with natural gas to replace, specifically replace uh, uh, coal. Well, there's an, uh, financial incentives and also the possibility of the government being the first user of one of these things. Remember, that was part of our stewardship program for the, har for large, for the computing industry. We were the first, if you will, Actually, it was the, uh, not just the uh, uh, not just the NNSA labs, but also the Office of Science labs together became the first users of these high performance computing. And of course, if you look at the DOE sites where they are, what they're doing, well, what are they? They're primarily accelerators of one sort or another and large computers. Well, if you add up the amount of electricity that these things use, it's a lot of electricity. So we could be the first users, if you will, in making that basically happening. Uh, so again, I think that you put it together with the basic timely goal, and the answer is, well, wait a minute, did Fukushima make this thing the Sputnik moment or, or not? We'll see. Okay, so with that, I'll stop and answer any questions you might have.